if I think about the progress I've made in three years, um, it's, it's profound. I mean, I'm not the same human being I was three years ago, that there's simply no comparison. And one of the first things I had to go after was the inner monologue, which, yeah. which was a very, very destructive um, inner monologue. And it was something that I had never not known. So there was never, I don't have a conscious memory of not having this harsh, at times violent, awful voice that would speak to me, speak to me and, and not just in, silently, like it would do so audibly as well. So if I made mistakes, um, you know, I was going to berate myself for them. And it didn't take a rocket scientist to know that a big part of the problem was, was, you know, what was at the root of that? And then how could we fix that? Because that was then leading to so much other problem and conflict in my life. So without going into the details of it, um, because I do so on those other podcasts, which um, we can talk about if you like, but the process of undoing that, which was, a was rooted in a very daily deliberate behavior practice um, took maybe six months to undo that voice. So that surprised me because mm -hmm. I really did believe that that was a permanent feature of my existence. That was as permanent as my height or my eye color. Um, and I was very surprised, delighted that, you know, the, 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 the plasticity um, of, of the human mind could allow me to kind of rewire that in only six months. Oh, and now admittedly of working very, very hard in those six months, but yeah, that was, that was very pleasant. So no, I, I'm actually incredibly optimistic that, you know, 10 years from now, I'm going to be, you know, in far better shape than I am now emotionally, yeah. uh, might not, might not be physically and cognitively as sharp at 60 as I am at 50, but I think emotionally I'll be in a better place. And the, tr in other words, I think the trajectory is positive. Thank you for sharing that. Going back to what we said earlier on in the conversation, physical, cognitive, emotional. And of course, we were discussing how, you know, physical and cognitive get worse with age. And I was sort of saying, yeah, as you were just demonstrating there, I think emotional yeah. can get better with age, actually. And I don't know, maybe counteract some of that other stuff, potentially, but that's a, that's a much uh, deeper and, and longer discussion. Without sort of going back into the detail you have already shared on those other podcasts, I think what might be useful in terms of a practical tool is simply sharing what you had to do to change the negative voice in your head. Because clearly negative voices in our heads are so common. Yours sounded particularly brutal, I must say, when I heard it. Uh, mm. I did recognize elements of it as well in myself. Um, but to see that change dramatically in six months, I think is really empowering. Would you mind sort of briefly sharing what that exercise was that enabled you to do that? Sure, sure. So, um, the the voice was basically uh, the voice of a, a guy, a, a very famous uh, college basketball coach, former basketball coach in the U.S. named Bobby Knight. So Bobby Knight was this insanely angry, maniacal, you know, savant of a basketball coach, but who ultimately lost his career over his temper. Um, and every every game was like a witnessing some crazy temper tantrum that he would have. Um, and so the exercise was framed as, you know, you, you have a board of directors that runs your life, the board of directors in your head. And unfortunately, this guy, Bobby Knight, is the chairman of the board. And we have to get him out of the boardroom. Um, we have to get him far enough away from the boardroom that you don't hear him talking all the time. So the way we're going to do this is every time you hear him talk, and that's going to happen anytime you do something in the pursuit of um, what we would call performance-based esteem. So basically, most things I'm doing in life, I'm doing so that I can uh, generate self-esteem. So just as an alcoholic might turn to a drink or a gambler might turn to a slot machine, I turn to performance as the drug. That's literally the drug that I need to have the, the self-esteem. And anytime those performance-based esteem uh, activities fail to generate esteem because I fail in the activity, I turn the rage inward. Just as an alcoholic 
would be furious if he walked into a bar and asked for a vodka and received a water. He would be furious at the bartender. That's basically the cycle that's happening. So the exercise was every time you feel that happen, I want you to imagine that it is your closest friend that committed the act in which you failed, right? So for example, if you're in your driving simulator, you know, driving is one of my huge passions. So if I'm not on a racetrack, I'm in a simulator and you're having a bad day, you're just not driving well, you're spinning, you're crashing, your, your times are slow, whatever it is. Normally you would get out of the simulator and you'd be yelling and screaming and sometimes even break the simulator. Instead, imagine that your closest friend was the one in the simulator who drove poorly. What would you say to him? And, you know, to do this exercise, you have to be able to picture the person. And so for this exercise, I would typically pick a friend of mine named Matt Walker, who you may recognize. Matt Walker wrote the a great book on sleep. And Matt's a very, very dear friend who is also a total motorhead gearhead, uh, loves cars. Whenever he comes over here, the two of us are going to be in the simulator the whole time. So I would look at Matt. I would picture Matt, close my eyes, and I would imagine what I was saying to Matt if he drove that poorly. And of course, it would be very kind, very loving, very supportive. And I would record that discussion on my phone and I would send that recording to my therapist. So two or three times every single day, my therapist would be getting one of these five minute voice memos from me where I would be talking to one of my friends in this type of situation. And that was simply the exercise. We've had the advice before on this show, particularly when I spoke to Kristen Neff, uh, who's done a lot of the research into self-compassion. Yeah, you know, talk to yourself as if you were talking to your best friend or a young child. And I think we intuitively get that. But I think what makes your exercise, the one that you were given to do so powerful, there's an extra component of accountability. It's not just, oh yeah, I wouldn't say that. Oh, come on, change the record in your heads. No, you have to record that message and send it to somebody who is going to hear it. So maybe you could just speak to what was so powerful about sending it? Was it embarrassing? Were you read it? Were you then, oh man, I have to send this to someone? Like, was the goal that you then play them back to you to sort of subliminally change the messaging you give yourself? Or, or, or just, just give us a little bit more detail there if you can. Well, I think, the, I think the recording is important because I think when you say it out loud, it's much more powerful than just thinking it. So it's one thing to say, mm. okay, I just you know shot poorly in the, with my bow and arrow or I drove poorly in the simulator. I'm going to now sort of think nice thoughts. But the reality of it is Bobby's voice is too loud for me to outthink him in silence. I have to outspeak him. Right. This is the, the, the mind works through concentration and there is there are very few things that can harness your concentration more than the audible sound you make with your own mouth. So I have to outspeak this otherwise very loud force in my mind, who, by the way, sometimes would actually speak to me. Right. I would sometimes actually speak what he was saying. So I, I have to one up him in volume. And then secondly, the recording it and sending it is not about being embarrassing. It's, as you said, it's accountability. It's, there's a person who knows that two, three, four times every day, I engage in some behavior that is demanding of my perfectionism and is a vehicle for which I generate self-esteem. And therefore, I'm going to have commentary. So it's, it's really those two things. And, and so therefore, by forcing the audible overwriting of a historical way of doing things, I'm rewriting. And by having the accountability, I'm making sure that no matter how much I don't want to do it, I do it. Going back to what you said before, Peter, about having the means to pay for a residential inpatient facility to deal with a lot of the inner conflict you were feeling at the time and wanting to pay it forward. I'm just trying to think, is there something there in that exercise that people at home can actually utilize themselves? For example, of course, it's not the same as having a therapist. I understand that. But just as if, for example, you're recommending to a patient 
to work out more, whatever that may mean, you may sometimes, I'm guessing, you know, ask them to have an accountability partner who can show up with them to make sure that they're doing it and they can help encourage each other together. Could a version of this be with a close friend, someone you trust, perhaps your partner? Could it be that you go, actually, you know what, I'm going to ask them if for the next month I can do that exercise with them? Would they be willing to be that person for me? Do you think that could be a good thing or do you see any potential problems with that? I'd have to give it some thought, but my my inclination out of the gate is probably not to select a romantic partner for yeah. that exercise. I think that probably would introduce some unnecessary strain on a relationship, but I think it could be done with a friend. That might not be as ideal as a therapist because the advantage of doing it with a therapist is you know, in my case, once a week, I'm going to talk to that person as well. And yeah. we're going to process those things. And by the way, some of them were just so significant that she would just call me right away, right? Like she would listen to it and, you know, call me an hour later just to check on me or something like that. So there's something to be said for that. But I, but I think if the alternative is not doing it, yeah, th then doing it with a friend, I think would be, you know, a far better option than not doing it. Are there any practices you try and do on a daily basis or at least a regular basis that keep your emotional health in tune or is it something you just go to from time to time no no it's a it's a huge deal and in fact when i left pcs which i write about in the book it's the place i went to in arizona in 2020 um you know i had a recovery contract that i made and the recovery contract had red light behaviors, yellow light behaviors, green light behaviors. So red light behaviors were things I never, ever, ever wanted to happen again. And if they happened, I understood that that was a trip back to rehab. Yellow light behaviors were warning signs. This was a very important part of the journey. One of the things that frightened me so much in my life was how seemingly unpredictable my meltdowns had appeared. Uh, I, again, I write about this in the book that I was so paranoid that I was like the space shuttle challenger that just out of the, out of nowhere would blow up over the sky. And the round of it is that space shuttle challenger, which for people don't remember is the space shuttle that blew up in January of 1986. Mm -hmm. That turned out to be an entirely predictable disaster had people been paying attention to what the engineers were telling them. And so there were lots of yellow lights that predicted that the space shuttle challenger was going to blow up that day. It's just people didn't pay attention. And so I had to now identify what my yellow light behaviors were. And they had to be plastered right in front of me in a contract that I looked at twice a day, every day. And whenever those things happened, which they did, that necessitated an increase in therapy and immediate discussion mm -hmm. with somebody. It was all about cooling the flames. And then there were the green light behaviors, which were what you're asking about. What are the things that I have to do every single day? And these are the things that are going to widen my distress tolerance window. That's the sort of figure I include in the book, yeah. right? Which is like, I have to widen my operating range as, as, as much as possible. Um, this is something kind of through the, the type of therapy I do called dialectical behavioral therapy. That's really geared towards making me as emotionally resilient to stressors as possible. So it's really through those lenses that I approach the day. But just to give you an example of some of the green light behaviors, um, exercise is important. So exercising every day, but doing so in a non-forced way. This is a very important thing for someone like me. Exercise has always been important to me, but what I had to do was not learn to exercise more, but at times learn to exercise less mm. and learn that, you know, if on Sunday you're trying to get a double workout in, but it's ultimately the choice between spending a little bit more time with your kids or getting that second workout in, maybe the better thing to do is actually just spend time with the kids and not get the second workout and, and be okay with that. Yeah. Um, and be okay with that being the key thing there. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and over time that becomes easier and easier and easier. Um, for a long period of time, for about a year, I did not permit myself to score in archery, meaning in, in archery, when you do it competitively, you actually have scores. You keep scores of like exactly where the arrows are hitting. And for a year, I did not do that. So I still practiced archery, but I didn't score it. In other words, I had to take out some of the performance. I also, for six months, did not ever 
drive the simulator and do archery on the same day. I know these things sound kind of crazy, but you have to understand for somebody who's recovering in the way that I was, I didn't want to have too many of these performance-based mm. things stacking up. I also wanted to not look at my phone from the time I woke up for about, you know, so let's say I woke up around 5.30 in the morning. The goal would be to not look at my phone or do any work until my kids left for school at 7.15. So just hang out with my wife, have coffee and play with my kids. That, that was sort of a very important part of resetting. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. As we make sit down every day to make a decision about what we eat or we go to the store to buy some food, we need to realize whatever we put into our body is either going to take our health down or build our health back up.